for those of you who don't know me from uh, BW Tech, uh, my name is Nick Seichu, um, the Senior Manager of Cyber Initiatives at BW Tech. Um, just some background on the organization. Uh, we're the Research and Technology Park of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. And as a university that has a, a sizable presence at NSA, UMBC is constantly involved in cyber activities. And the work we do at BW Tech uh, largely supports uh, startups, small businesses, and helps them as they commercialize and grow businesses across you know, anything from security, privacy, defense, and intelligence. So it's a really fun group. And uh, once things start opening back up, we'd uh, love to see you in person, but glad we can have this webinar. <laughs> and uh, really glad that Hank Thomas is joining us. He's uh, the CTO at SCVX and is a publicly traded SPAC focused on cybersecurity. And uh, Hank is also the CEO of Strategic Cyber Ventures, which is a VC firm based in DC. And prior to becoming an investor, Hank uh, had a career in the Army and worked with Booz Allen Hamilton as a cybersecurity consultant and executive. So I'm really thrilled to have you joining us today and uh, share some of your insights. Absolutely, happy to be here. Yeah, so I guess I can start off with you know, how this uh, talk came about last year, um, you know, actually really around this uh, a week or two, give or take from last year, I was at RSA and uh, I sat next to one of your board members at a dinner, uh, Sunil Yu, who uh, was the chief security scientist at Bank of America. And he was telling me about your uh, blank check IPO company in cybersecurity. And at the time, I really had uh, very little understanding of you know, SPACs and how they're, uh, you know, playing into the broader IPO market. And just, you know, the way he talked about what you're planning to do in uh, bringing this company forward was something that, you know, sparked an interest. And, you know, lo and behold, uh, over the next year, you know, we've seen SPACs, uh, you know, become, I think, around 50% of the IPO market. Um, the past year, there were around 230 that raised $80 billion. And over 200 of them are seeking acquisitions this year. So it's really uh, become timely and it's, you know, an exciting uh, path to liquidity. So um, I'm sure that you've uh, gotten your SPAC spiel down, Hank, and uh, you know, I'd really appreciate if you could uh, give a little bit of a, an intro to, you know, what are the basics of SPACs as an, uh, an entity? How, why are they chosen? And, you know, how are they different from some of the typical routes that a company might take towards IPOing? Sure, yeah. Um, I think uh, the, the basic, uh, in, in today's world, I think the advantages of for SPAC are obviously a, a quicker path to IPO, uh, maybe for a, a company in an emerging space. Um, that's what I call a tweener. I don't think it's an official financial term, but uh, they're not quite a, um, you know, a typically ready kind of packaged um, ready to IPO entity, you know, with, a, a, let's say, a, a north of a $3 billion enterprise valuation. Um, you know, they're, they're typically, you, you've seen a lot of EV SPACs in the last year, electric vehicle SPACs in the last year. Um, that's the other end of the spectrum. It's super early stage speculative stuff with almost no revenue um, that people want to kind of bet on the future. So uh, I think ultimately the rise of the SPAC was because of, uh, was, was mostly generated from uh, features of, of a traditional IPO that were just kind of viewed as broken. Uh, and they also, the typical IPO, um, boxed a lot of people out from participating in them. Uh, and so, and I'm talking about um, the average investor, the consumer investor, but it also boxed out um, founders of companies that wanted to take their uh, technology to the public markets and believe in themselves. And, you know, really IPO is just another way of raising capital. Um, it's, it, but there was somehow this sort of line that was drawn that said like, how you can't go to the public markets and do things with public people <laughs> unless you're, you've reached this certain scale. And that scale was sort of arbitrarily drawn over, over time. Now you have SPACs with really smart teams behind them um, that, you know, reduce the risk, I think, for a lot of people, because if those teams don't find a target within the approved amount of time, um, investors get their money back. Um, and it's really only the team behind the SPAC that, you know, is, is out any money. So speed to speed to market, meaning the public markets, um, the cost of capital 
uh, in many cases right now, um, based on where valuations are, is much lower. So if I was a high growth, high multiple, in my case, cybersecurity company, uh, the last thing I would want to do uh, to take it to the next level would be take money from a private equity firm because they're just going to over leverage you and slow your growth. Uh, and when in reality, in a space like cybersecurity, if you're a next generation, if you're a technology from the future, which is what we're looking for, uh, last thing you want is leverage on you. You want to be able to grow and have the flexibility you need to be continue to be a 2.0 or a 3.0 technology. I, I really agree with what you said, and especially where you touched on, you know, there's some of these arbitrary, uh, you know, things that just kind of came into being, you know, I mean, we look at, uh, you know, the market capitalizations of some of the largest companies in tech and where they were at when they IPO'd. And it's, you know, really uh, changed a lot in just the past couple of decades. Uh, and maybe you could uh, touch on your background in cybersecurity, how you got into the field and, you know, uh, what excites you about it. Sure. Yeah, no, I, um, I guess 23 years now in security in some capacity, uh, I was an army intelligence officer for eight years. The, let's say that the first four of that eight, I was doing tactical intelligence stuff. So uh, very, uh, very nuggy kind of Intel support to like the infantry and stuff like that. And then uh, just after 9-11, I, I was assigned to the National Security Agency where I worked uh, building some of the earliest cyber units, let's call them that, uh, that were army, the army component of NSA focused on cyber. Um, after I left that portion of my life, I went to Booz Allen, as a lot of people do in the DC area, and worked on the federal side building um, security programs for the government and the military. And uh, somewhere along the line there, we had, um, we decided we weren't practicing what we were preaching corporately at Booz Allen. Uh, we had a series of things happen. We had this, uh, we had this guy called Edward Snowden work for us. We had, uh, we had, um, we were attacked by anonymous. <laughs> There's a lot of things that happened. And we, uh, we built a world-class security team internal to Booz Allen uh, that we like we built for our customers. We got really good at it. And then we started building it for Fortune 1000 customers, um, building their security operation centers, um, building their threat intelligence programs. And then uh, five years ago, came with the idea to start a venture capital firm solely focused on cybersecurity. Uh, we've been investing in that space for a while now. And then a few years ago, as the market, the cybersecurity market, uh, we looked around to our left or right and to our rear. It's like this is a highly fractionated market. Uh, we're part of the. We're part, we've been a part of that. We've been investing in companies that do point solution things. Now the average Fortune 1000 CISO has 120 security controls in their ecosystem. Um, we need to move towards the cybersecurity singularity here. And a SPAC looked like a really cool way to um, that was being used in other industries to roll up a number of interesting ingredients into a more powerful platform and sort of take it to the next level as a part of this consolidation trend that's happening in cybersecurity. Security operators, whether in the government or, or industry, they don't want a million tools anymore. They want less tools that do more things. Yeah, it seems like that's a, you know, just looking at the sheer amount of tools and, you know, how many people are supposed to have knowledge of those tools just become overwhelming. Um, maybe it's when you talked about, you know, this forming of SCVX, uh, the SPAC for um, going after the singularity, how did you put that team together? Because you have some really accomplished people on that team uh, and maybe just touching on that. What yeah, I, we, we wanted to be really a, an all blue chip SPAC is what I was calling it, you know, at the time, uh, last well, we were pulling this together in the fall of 2019. Uh, really, very few people I talked to knew what a SPAC was. Even when we IPO'd in January of 2020, nobody knew really knew what a SPAC was. Uh, and then, you know, now you know, the spring and the summer of this past year, SPACs became very popular, and now you know, it's a lot more common to know what it is. But you know, we we wanted to create history in cybersecurity via a SPAC. Uh, so we wanted a, a team that sort of reflected that. So we task organized. I was really the one responsible for kind of building out the team. And uh, because this fact is backed by my venture capital firm, Strategic Cyber Ventures. And um, we wanted to kind of anchor it at the top with somebody that had an over the horizon view of, of national security. Um, so we uh, had a relationship with Senator Dan Coates, Director Coates, who was the 
uh, recently departed director of national intelligence. And he clearly squit, uh, fit into that um, uh, seat perfectly, you know, the over the horizon view. We wanted a very technical person that had been at the ground level screening products going into the most discerning buyers in cybersecurity, which is the financial services industry. Uh, if, you, if you can get your product into Bank of America, uh, your product must actually do something. Um, and that's what Sunil's job was, is the, the mad scientist at Bank of America, Sunil Yu. Um, and so he's, Sunil is a very technical yet um, ex, uh, individual, but also has executive experience at Bank of America and, and at Booz Allen, we were colleagues at Booz Allen. Uh, we wanted to have somebody that had active, current, real world right now, chief information security officer experience and that's what Jeff Lungelhofer brings to the table from Bank of New York, uh, one of the world's, the U.S.'s oldest fin financial institutions. Um, also, I would say an A-plus player in cybersecurity. And uh, last but not least, uh, on, the, on the purely board side would be Vivian Schneck last, who spent her, most of her career at Goldman Sachs in the technology procurement side of things, working to um, bring world-class technology into kind of like one of the biggest names in financial services as well. Uh, and also brings outside board perspective from other, other board seats that she sits on. And, and I didn't have the Wall Street experience um, from my venture capital and cybersecurity operational days. So partnered up with Mike Doniger, uh, who's also on our board. And uh, he has over 20 years of experience on Wall Street. And he knows, uh, I mean, I think valuation is his expertise. So, you know, we're looking to build a billion dollar plus uh, company and we wanted to make sure we had the right ingredients to do that and the right uh, connections on Wall Street. And, and Mike has absolutely brought that to the table. That's awesome. Yeah. Now, um, with your experience running the VC firm, how would you say that really uh, allows you to have, you know, maybe a different perspective or what is uh, in itself um, different when you look at, you know, companies from a venture capitalist perspective versus uh, companies for an IPO perspective? Yeah, I, you know, if I, if I, if I wasn't doing the spec, I think I would, um, the kind of perspective I would want to have as a VC would be, you know, a very tactical, almost like, you know, in the seats of a found up starter, uh, uh, a starter of a found up, you know, and, uh, because you get that tactical view, let's take this back away for a second, and you understand like what's needed to build that company, and then you build that company, and then you go back to being an investor for years on the venture side, and you can kind of broaden your horizon and get out of that group think from that individual company and see what else is happening, maybe outside of security, what's happening in you know health tech and uh, fintech and other places, and your mind opens up, and you can you could probably transition to go back to being a, a founder of a startup again. I try to do that on the venture side because we try to maintain a very boutique -y, um, you know, involved approach with our, with our relatively small portfolio. But on the, on the SPAC side, we are, we're solely focused on security. Um, so having a perspective of how the market has evolved over my 23 years in security, but, um, I guess more importantly over my fat my last five years in venture, uh, I think is invaluable to finding the, the absolutely critical ingredients to building what we're trying to build. Because I mean, a lot of people reach to us and they say, have you, have you found your target yet? And it's like, well, yeah, we have, we have, our, we have lots of ingredients that, that are going into our, our target. Uh, our target isn't like other SPACs where it's one ingredient and you're one and done. We, we want to build something that has, um, that X factor to it that is an anchor, but has several of components to it that make it a truly differentiated cybersecurity platform company. Um, and so I don't think I would be as effective at doing this if I was just a SPAC founder, if I haven't been focused on cybersecurity venture capital for the last five years, which get, we feel like gives us an unfair advantage with the SPAC. Yeah, I mean, the ability to pull those multiple pieces together uh, definitely sets you apart from the other offerings that, you know, you, we hear about. Um, to what extent does geography play, you know, come into mind when you're looking at where these companies are based? Um, you know, I think in the past year, um, given your base in DC, we've 
heard a lot about, you know, is sort of California exodus, um, these up and coming um, startup hubs, you know, like in Austin and Miami. Uh, do you like look at where a startup is located? What's the density of talent? And also looking at where, you know, cyber talent is also, is that, how does that come into mind? Yeah, well, you know, most of the, the anchor side of the keys that we're looking at for like the, the key component to our ingredient, the ingredients we're pulling together um, have hundreds of employees. Uh, and in many cases, they're not all in the same place. You know, they might have a, a city where the, there's their headquarters. Um, and, but they, they've taken a best app. Mo in most cases, I would say they've taken a best athlete approach in cybersecurity and they have um, a lot of their more technical talent is spread out across the U.S. Um, with, a, with a core group being, you know, in, a, in one particular city. Um, and it, I, it, you know, if essentially we've looked as far away as Israel um, in, our, in our hunt, you know, as we've narrowed down to our kind of like the finalists, um, and we've obviously looked, uh, very closely here in the U S you know, in the UK, um, it, it hasn't played a huge role. It hasn't played a huge role in, in our decision-making. Um, you know, there's a couple of threat actor countries we've, uh, particularly excluded from, uh, any evaluation whatsoever. Uh, but that's probably not a surprise for, for anyone. No, and it's interesting that, you know, uh, to hear how you're looking looking internationally that you know that's uh, something that's open and um given just the you know the size of the security uh landscape you know are there any um areas that you said okay we want to you know really uh find this interesting or any um sectors that you say you know we're not really looking to do x y or z yeah we've had lots of uh, opinions uh around this and our our last year was kind of broken into four categories to kind of get us to where, to narrow our focus. You know, the, after our IPO in January, we spent, I'd say, two months explaining to the cybersecurity community what a SPAC was. Uh, then we spent three months explaining to what all their boards, uh, all the boards of these companies, what a SPAC was. Um, then we spent uh, three months working with companies to kind of figure out um, whether their metrics made sense for, a, you know, a billion dollar plus publicly traded company. Um, and that in cybersecurity kind of, uh, once you have those levels of conversations and you uh, figure out uh, companies of the appropriate size, um, that narrows your focus to, um, to get to the scale that you need to be an effective company here. Um, for at least for the anchor, that narrows the, the scope down to, I would say, uh, I don't know, less than 20% less than of the total cybersecurity ecosystem because many of those companies aren't aren't big enough to kind of fit into that anchor size uh group of companies um and then we can really we really spent the rest of our time highly focused on that uh i would i would bucket it uh generally speaking is the haves and the have nots the 1.0s and the 2.0s of, of of technology you can quickly then look in there and say this is an antiquated 1.0 technology we're not interested in it at all this is this is this solves cybersecurity problems of the past. We, interestingly enough, have uh, heavily relied on the cyber defense matrix, which is a product produced by Sunil Yu, uh, which is one of the reasons we, we picked him to do this was, uh, it's a tool that I found effective and it was easily explained to other people. Just, and, and, and something he used at Bank of America to make um, purchasing decisions. Um, we've essentially said, we don't really care what corner of the matrix the anchor entity ends up on. Um, we think all four corners are interesting, whether you're, you know, on the left of bang or the right of bang, to use a military term, meaning pre-breach or post-breach. Um, there are interesting enough adjacency, adjacent technologies, all four corners of that matrix that we can build a really cool platform. So if we end up with something in the upper right quadrant of that matrix, uh, there are cool technologies around that. There are smaller companies that could be a part of this complete business combination for us to bring them together to create this sort of game-changing um, platform we're looking to build. Um, so there, I wouldn't say we've we've ruled out um, any one sector of cybersecurity, we, but we have ruled out things that that wouldn't allow us to build a, uh, a technology of the future. And obviously, the the pandemic um, has accelerated 
uh, what that looks like as many people have left uh, the traditional enterprise to do other things. And uh, so those, you know, those, the, ne the necessity for many of those ingredients is, is only increased and uh, is realigned our focus a bit. Um, I think we're right on, right on our timeline in that uh, we knew that this wasn't gonna be a, a SPAC that we launch and then we find a deal and we're done. Like we're just transactional, you know, we, we're, intention we're being very intentional about this to find the absolute right ingredients to pull it together. Um, and so we're like, we're basically right on our timeline for, for getting this done. And when you say ingredients, you, you're essentially, I think, saying that there might be multiple companies that equal one uh, SPAC entity. Um, and that's kind of in contrast to, you know, many of the other ones where it's, you know, say taking one company and uh, bringing it public. Uh, how do you weigh the technical considerations for, you know, these companies, you know, being uh, put together? Um, you know, I, I imagine there's some great opportunities with like, you know, uh, administration, sales, marketing, being able to condense that. But um, I imagine our, you know, tech stack, something that come into mind. Absolutely. For sure. I mean, that that's, that's part of what the um, deliberate process we're going through is, is that, you know, you don't want to say, okay, now that we've landed in the upper right hand quadrant of the cyber defense matrix, and we found our anchor, and there's uh, two other ingredients that we're going to, we don't want to say the next word to be bolt on, we want them to be integrated. Uh, because we don't want to bolt on anything uh, and um, we don't want to just tuck in anything. We want to integrate uh, what we're building. We want it to be integratable. Um, so making sure all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed on the technical ability for these things to be integrated and, to and for one plus one to equal three is kind of what we're going through right, right now. Um, and that is a... Uh, that's not an easy process, but I think it's a very unique process because I feel that a lot of our competition, if you want to call it that, um, isn't willing to go that length to build something like that. Um, and but we we feel it's absolutely necessary uh, to achieve the outcome that we want to achieve. And uh, and we have so we have a team that's technical enough to do that. Uh, and where we're not. Uh, we, we've been able to bring in resources to help us uh, evaluate and um, uh, discern whether um, the, uh, the linkages that we think can be made can be made. No, and when you mention, uh, you know, competition, uh, one of the things that, you know, I thought of is uh, Dave DeWalt announced, you know, this uh, Night Dragon Acquisition Corp SPAC. And, you know, how do you see being, you know, the first uh, cybersecurity focus spec, you know, helping you and, um, you know, your, your ability to uh, target companies that might, you know, not be uh, the ones that he's targeting given this, you know, combined nature. Um, do you see additional entrants really helping validate this market for, uh, you know, cybersecurity companies? I mean, he, he might have, he might have better hair than me. The, uh, <laughs> yeah, <I don't, laughs> the, uh, no, I'm just, just joking. He, um, no, I, I figured it was coming. Uh, the You had to figure that you weren't going to be the world's first cyber. I wouldn't want to be the world's first and only ever cybersecurity SPAC. Uh, just like with our startups in our portfolio, um, the, you know, you don't want to have a startup with no competition because it means there's not really a market. Um, there have been other people out there that when it benefits them in SPAC land, portray themselves to be cybersecurity SPACs, but they're also looking for targets outside of cybersecurity. We've had plenty of uh, companies come to us uh, that want to use our SPAC just to go public, and we've we've passed on all those deals. We don't we don't want to take a, um, a ski resort public. You know, we we want to stick to our mission here, uh, and we don't want to distress the asset. I think um, what uh, uh, what they're doing. Um, I, I saw that yesterday. Uh, I think there's plenty of room in cybersecurity for there to be the building of platforms that do different things uh, as a part of this total consolidation trend that I was referring to, you know, moving towards the cybersecurity singularity. I, I don't really believe there's, that's any, that a, a truly, you know, being a bit facetious about calling it singularity, but, you know, it's essentially average CISO 120 security controls, moving it towards 40 or 50 you know, not just an orb that controls everything in front of them. And I think uh, 
why not have more SPACs focused on this to, to start to roll this up? There's a there's a lot of cybersecurity companies out there that are in trouble right now. I, I can tell you that. I mean, there's plenty, I mean, not everyone, but there's plenty of them that are out there that have kind of plateaued and they don't know what their, uh, their next step is. Um, they either have to cut costs and become, uh, you know, you know, cash flow positive in some capacity, um, or they need to find they need to, they can't continue to rely on venture capital funding forever for their survival. They, at some point, they have to become a viable entity on their own or be integrated into something else. And there's literally thousands of them out there now. Not all of them are, are as I'm describing right now, but there are plenty that are, and there are plenty that should probably no longer be an individual product on their own because that's not the way the buyers are buying things anymore. Um, so I, uh, good on them. I mean, that's, there's probably should be more, um, to help. And, and I think when we do that, we're also going to allow for the next generation of early stage cybersecurity companies to, um, yeah. have access to some of the needed capital to grow the thinking needed to solve the problems of the future. Um, that maybe aren't being that maybe aren't being solved right now because everyone's kind of worried about what their next move is. And uh, one of the things I, I, I want to know how like it factors into your thought process because that, that's really a good point about just there's all these companies and at a certain point you know the buck's got to stop somewhere. Um, how does uh, you know the government impact your decision making uh, with cybersecurity? You know we have. Uh, CMMC coming in with uh, defense and uh, privacy legislation in Europe and, you know, starting out in California. Um, do you see um, that as an opportunity for how you put this uh, together or is it more one of these uh, indirect factors? I think it's an indirect factor. I, I, we're definitely going to not let government regulations and uh, the ebbs and flows of, of privacy laws and um, breach disclosure laws drive, um, that would be like, kind of like letting a lawyer drive your business, um, in my, in my mind. And every time I've, that we've gotten, every time in my life, when that we've gotten close to a lawyer running the business, things went the opposite direction, <laughs> things went the opposite direction. So, uh, you know, we're going to be a, remain a free thinking SPAC, uh, that is, um, pulling together the ingredients we think are necessary. And of course, we're going to pay attention to what those things are because they can often lead towards um, the way things need to be designed or for large revenue streams, which will be important. Uh, but they're not the they're not the the driving force behind this at all. And uh, when when you talk about you know how the leadership of these businesses is going to work. How do you view uh, your role uh, being in these companies after you know they're selected, the merge happens? Um, do you anticipate being involved day to day or more taking the advisory uh, approach? I think yeah, I think that's a that a lot of people are confused about that uh, when they're learning about SPACs and they they it looks like oh it's a reverse merger so you guys are taking over absolutely not the case uh, you know we want to be we want to play a supporting role wherever it is most beneficial. To the, the business combination we're pulling together. If if that's me manning a booth at the RSA conference, I'll do it. If that's me uh, sitting on your board of directors because you think I'm the right person, or you think Senator Coates is the right person, or Sunil's the right person, or Vivian, great. Uh, you know, but we don't even. Um, you know, I think in, uh, as as it, as it shapes up. Um, as I've talked to the landscape of companies out there that are interested in doing this and we've narrowed our focus, uh, most people want there to be, in general, they, they want there to be a role. Um, but, you know, again, we're not going after, uh, in any case, going after any distressed assets. So the CEOs and the CFOs and the CTOs of these companies are people we want to work with and we want them, we don't want them leaving. Uh, so we want to play a support role um, wherever, wherever possible. Um, and so I think it, it's, I think it's going to be very much situationally dependent on the final ingredients as they come together and, and the, and the wishes of the management of the, of the entity. Yeah, that makes sense. It sounds like a, a lot of this is all, you know, uh, fluid and you're going to work with the companies as it, um, develops. Um, so a, a bit of a, uh, elephant in the room question, uh, you know, Wall Street bets and GameStops a few weeks ago, they're, you know, these forums that are getting really excited and having this uh, unique uh, 
impact in the public markets. How do you see them, uh, you know, clearly they're getting very excited about SPACs. Um, what is your, you know, impact on, you know, these retail investors, you know, really helping to drive up the price of some of these entities and whether, you know, it's a, a net positive, negative or neutral for SPACs? Uh, I, you know, I, I think a SPAC would be a really weird uh, uh, place for them to get involved. Um, you know, I it, it, like, like it was a few weeks ago right now. I, I mean, I guess, uh, I guess there, where there's a will is a way. Um, it hasn't impacted the way we're doing business at all. Um, you know, we're, our goal is to build a product that's ultimately going to make the world a safer place. Uh, I would hope people would want to get behind that. Um, once that, once all the ingredients are together and it's announced, um, and even prior to that, you know, pay attention and, and be a part of the journey with us. Um, but I, you know, in, in SPAC land, I haven't heard um, people, uh, it, it hasn't, it's been something we've monitored, uh, just like everybody at the rest of the world, world has. Uh, monitored might be a strong word, just, you know, been curious about, <laughs> uh, but it, there's been no direct impact on the way we're doing things. Other than I think it plays into um, sort of the origin story of why SPACs just are become so popular is that, you know, the average person wants access. If you know who who is it, who is it? Uh, how is it um, okay for us to responsibly tell the world who who can't invest in things? Uh, and I just I'm of the mind that if um, if people of a certain category in life can invest in things, there should be the same opportunity afforded to people of, of, of any stripe of life. And uh, and I think that SPACs give people an opportunity to dream the dream a bit um, that they didn't have before through traditional IPOs. Now, I didn't know how that, I didn't even, you know, I'm not a Wall Street guy. I didn't know how the IPO market worked prior to, you know, the gory details of it like I do now. And I totally get why SPACs uh, have risen to popularity, um, you know, just because the process, the traditional process really does uh, limit who can be involved in the most lucrative part of the process. And, and I think SPAC opens that up, SPACs opens that up for people. No, I, I really appreciate that answer. And I think that uh, just looking at time, uh, it'd be great if anyone has any you know questions from the audience to you know throw those in the Q and A, and we can you know move into some of those. And um, I think one of the first ones I'll ask. Uh, I think uh, someone asked that: Are you able to comment on whether or not you have found a target company yet? I think you kind of uh, hinted that you know it's in progress uh, for that. Yeah, I mean, since we're since we're going about this a bit, a bit different way. Um, we're, we are not just looking for one target company um, like some other SPACs are, where they're just like target, target acquired, target neutralized. You know, it, uh, we're, we're trying to pull a few more ingredients together than I think um, other SPACs are to just because it's security and we're trying to be a part of this consolidation trend. Um, so I would say we are in the ninth inning of the ball game in uh, getting the appropriate uh, team on the field. Awesome. Yeah. And uh, I guess another question from uh, Sebastian is, uh, what are some of the key characteristics you're, you're looking for in these targets? I guess, you know, you're thinking about revenue. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, you, you, can, you can geek out on the cyber stuff all day long and say like, I'd like to have, you know, I'd like to build a platform with, you know, X, Y, and Z ingredient and bolt them all together and, or integrate them all together. And, uh, um, but ultimately it has to be of a certain size and scale to be interesting to the market, right? Um, and you, you, you have to achieve a certain valuation so that the cost of capital is uh, right for the, the company that, that, you're, that you're reverse merging with. Um, otherwise there's probably cheaper capital out there for them. So the ingredients have to be right for everyone to be excited about it and for it to, to trade well. You know, we, we built this we're in this for the long haul. Like we, this has to, we want this to trade well too. <laughs> we're not just, you know, SPAC complete and move away. You know, we're, we're sticking around. And um, so the, 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 I guess the, the key ingredients go to, um, one thing I've learned is the market really doesn't care about 
ARR. They care about revenue. Um, and we can get into, just like we could geek out about cyber stuff, um, we could geek out about what the difference is between ARR and revenue. But, you know, it, it, it's sort of self-explanatory. Uh, either you have it or you don't, right? And um, so, you know, we're looking for companies that are, are growing fast and have uh, relative to the rest of the cybersecurity market, um, have outperformed it. And um, there, you would be surprised at how many big name, big name, I live in the cybersecurity world, but how many cybersecurity companies that are a lot of people know about, especially here in the DC Baltimore area, because there's more people here that kind of maybe know about that stuff that have not reached the critical mass that you think they have. Um, and so um, that's, you know, that's kind of focused our scope on finding the ones that have and working with working with them. Um, so yeah, uh, revenue, super cool. I call it a 3.0 technology um, that is open enough that, that the other key ingredients um, can be integrated into it in a way that's building this thing we want to build. That was a great answer. It was really helpful to, I think, oftentimes you can see these massive uh, investments into companies and it's a, it's a black box into what that actually means for how they're doing as a business. Um, maybe you could uh, talk about the timeline for the merge process to be finished. You know, some people might not be familiar with uh, what happens once, you know, something's decided and when it starts trading under say the new uh, entity name. Yeah, I mean, let's, uh, you know, if in theory, I think the way um, most of these timelines work or with others and would, would work with us is uh, um, we would go under LOI with a, with a company, a letter of intent with a company uh, or a group of companies and um, you could either, you know, just hypothetically thinking, you could either bring all these companies together at the same time and then have them have the second IPO occur like at the same time. Like essentially it would be getting married, they would get engaged and then get married on the day of the second IPO. Um, or you could have one large entity, uh, you, we could get married to that entity, uh, go under LOI with it, then have the second IPO, um, uh, the de-spacking process. Uh, and one of the advantages of a SPAC is all this money on the balance sheet and the equity uh, can be used for acquisitions immediately, which can't happen in a traditional IPO uh, in the same way. And so some of these acquisitions and the integration might have been thought about in advance now, uh, but could be executed post de-spacking. Um, so how, how, how that would unfold is it would take, uh, it would probably take, um, you, you know, you could, if, if this was happening with somebody now, um, you would be having the second IPO sometime in uh, June or July, uh, possibly even May, just kind of depending on, you know, how all the, the paperwork shuffle goes. Um, that's just, that's just the timeline as I understand it. Uh, and, and from looking at other SPACs to our left and to the right, and, um, and knowing all the things we're trying to pull together is a little bit different in our case. So uh, could take could take a little bit longer. That makes sense. Uh, I'm gonna uh, read a bit of a question from Rohit. And uh, it's that, you know, new technologies uh, are really being ramped up there. You've got uh, clean energy, earth conservation, uh, you know, greater automation and bandwidth, um, you know, when you look at all these 5G's, AI's, satellites, there's a lot of cutting edge technology that people are talking about. Um, how do you, as a you know investor, ensure that this uh, become uh, that this is taken into account with the um, entity you're trying to build? So that it, you know, is it going to be another SaaS company, or do you anticipate it having you know something that's uh, more frontier tech? Um. It's definitely not, I mean, I we, there are no entities large enough to be a publicly traded uh, in security. I know of no company that's large enough that say specifically like a 5G cybersecurity company. Um, there, there are lots of people out there thinking about 5G cybersecurity and there's lots of startups that are like in support of 5G cybersecurity. I'm using this as an example. Um, 
but the entity itself is going to have to be much broader than that um, and, and cover a, a bigger chunk of things than just one one component of the total ecosystem. Um, so I hope I'm answering the question, but the way we're staying on top of that is I was actually I was just uh, asking one of our uh, team members the other day to to pull together a list of uh, um, of early stage 5G uh, cybersecurity focused companies. And there weren't as many as I, as I thought there were, uh, that at least we could find. You know, some, some of this is a, uh, people are like, you know, a lot of times people come to me and say like, uh, how many companies do this? Uh, you know, in the world of privately held companies, sometimes it's hard to figure out how many there are, who they are, what they do, especially super early stage companies, many of which are in stealth mode. Um, and so, yeah, I think, you know, what we're trying to build is much broader than anyone like um, technology sector that's kind of emerging right now, but we're taking that into consideration as to uh, just how open our platform is for protecting that when it becomes uh, a major part of our total ecosystem. No, that, that's definitely, uh, uh, you're, you're doing a lot of uh, work for some of these, you know, CISOs you plan to sell, sell to in the future by evaluating all these, you know, technologies that are uh, early. Um, uh, this question from Peyton is, uh, oh wait, uh, sorry, wrong question I was reading. Um, but I, one of the questions is, do you have plans to bring another SPAC to market? Um, and, you know, after you complete this one, do you anticipate, um, you know, going for a second one? I, I think we're going to, we're really hyper-focused on this one right now. Um, clearly we have the ability to do that. Um, but we didn't want to, uh, I actually six months ago, we were like, everyone else is like, you know, how many SPACs do you form at the same time? And I thought about it for a second. Um, but then we decided we're doubling down on making this one uber successful. Um, and we will, that decision point will be, you know, off on the horizon um, based on, uh, you know, how this one's, how this one's turning out. And so we, all of our energy is going into this right now. Uh, it, it is essentially um, our latest and largest portfolio company of strategic cyber ventures. So we, we treat it as such. We, we you know, we, we, we uh, focus on our portfolio. It's, we've kept it small intentionally. Uh, and this is our latest portfolio company. And there's, this is what we live and breathe every single day, getting the ingredients exactly right so that people have an aha moment when it's revealed. Awesome. I, I think uh, we're nearing uh, close to time. I think we said 1245. So I want to make sure that if anyone has any last minute questions, they're able to throw them in the Q&A or I'm also checking the chat. Um, I think one of the things that uh, is probably worth bringing up is, you know, there have been all these uh, breaches, hacks you see every day in the news. Um, how do you stay on top of all the, you know, the flood of information that uh, we get in cybersecurity? And, you know, are there any um, publications or sources do you look to when you're trying to stay informed? You know, I, I, the best conversations I have are with people that are still in the trenches. You know, I, I, I can listen to podcasts and get the top of the wave stuff and, you know, look at, um, um, uh, you know, DHS bulletins and read the Cyber Solarium report uh and all this other stuff it's it's when i talk to um friends of mine that are chiefs information security chief information security officers of fortune 1000 companies uh and people that are still working in government and are in the trenches and hearing about you know like yeah i know you saw that on cbs nightly news last night but did you know this you know and you're like oh wow that's how that impacted your company and that's um that's how uh malicious this thing really was that's how insidious this really was and like you could feel the the operational tension in the conversation uh i i missed that part of my old life and and doing this now so i i guess i seek that out that's how i that's how i do it uh i mean i that's the there's a lot of people in security that go they're talking heads and go on and say china bad russia bad hacking bad everything's bad and a lot of those things are bad, but they they not they're not in the trenches and they don't really know what's going on. 
Um, and when I say that, I, I feel that way too, because I, you know, I know these things are bad and I know about intellectual property theft and I know, you know, death by a thousand cuts. And there's a lot of really think, bad things at a strategic level going on there, but you've got to talk to a tactical operator in cyber to truly understand what's going on. That's how I do it. Thanks. I really appreciate uh, your responses uh, today and that, uh, I think this wraps us up today. Thanks for having me. Big, uh, big supporter of the Baltimore, DC, Maryland, Virginia, DMV, DMVB region. Like, uh, so I'm happy to be a part of it.